Well, would you look at this? One of the few NES carts I happen to own is Super Mario Bros. 3. Weird. I actually picked this up by sheer coincidence. This. Playing this game on the NES is literally my first memory ever. Uh, of course, I slightly remember some of the other games on the NES, but Mario Bros. 3 is what I remember most from that console. Still, I'd be lying if I said I remembered a lot of the NES versions of these games. The reason I've been playing the All-Stars version of all of these should, should probably show that. Yeah, I remember playing All-Stars in my SNES a lot more due to roughly being 5 or 6 by that point. Even then, I was obsessed with Mario. I played the hell out of the All-Stars pack. Playing the game on my Wii or Nintendo Switch is just a really nostalgic experience for me. Love reliving it. Due to my nostalgia though, Super Mario Bros. 3 is easily my favorite of the classic 2D Mario Bros. games, even when comparing it to Super Mario World. Don't get me wrong, I love Super Mario World. If anything, I'd even argue that it's a better game. I just happen to like Super Mario Bros. 3 more as all. Yeah, when it comes to the top spot of 2D platforming with the red wearing plumber, Super Mario World is often considered the best, with Super Mario Bros. 3 being a really close second. Hell, sometimes Super Mario Bros. 3 inches it out every so often. When dealing with one of the most influential games of all time as a rival, that's pretty good for an older NES game. I'm sure some of you may wonder if I'm going to bring up The Wizard, a feature film about the video games which, you know, was secretly an advertisement for this game, but truth be told, while I want to see it, I've never had the pleasure. Oh well, on my hit list for movies for sure, but that'll come at a later date. For now, I have this game to tackle. In the last NES Mario game actually takes a lot of concepts from Super Mario Bros. 2. You know, the one that we got here in the States. Yeah, vertical platforming and horizontal platforming are back, along with being able to carry certain blocks and shells similar to the veggies from previous games. So let's do this. The main enemies, making their first appearance, we have Bowser's seven adopted children. Let's take on the Koopalings! So the story this time around is actually very different from many Mario games. Bowser and his newly adopted children decide to take over other kingdoms. Yeah, they aren't going after Peach right away, they're taking over the other kingdoms near the Mushroom Kingdom. Why? Power Wands! Turns out the kings of all these areas have powerful magic wands and the Koopalings are trying to steal them. The Koopalings bring in an army that Mario has to stomp out, and Mario will also have to take out a very powerful airship and defeat one of the seven Koopa Kids to get his wand back. Well, not his wand, but one of the king's wands. If not, the king will probably look like a monster for the rest of its miserable life, and in the All-Stars version it will be a creature from Super Mario Bros. 2 or Super Mario World. That's kind of a nice touch. Anyway, every time you free a kingdom, Peach will send you a letter with a helpful item and tell you to defeat the last Koopaling. Turns out the entire plot was a distraction and Bowser took over the Mushroom Kingdom while you were out. Time to save the princess! Again. Yeah, I know, I know. Mario soon takes after Bowser's massive army of tanks, warships, airships, and defeats the King of Koopas himself. The day is saved. Peach makes fun of the original Mario Brothers, and all is well. But doesn't something seem, I don't know, off with all this? I think it's the way everything looks. The opening curtain draw at the start, pieces of the level being nailed to the background, is... Is this all a theater play? Even the map screens that you have before each level look like a wooden slider toy. Well, come to find out, yeah, it's all a show. Miyamoto confirms as much in an interview a few years back. The entire thing is supposed to be a big theater production. As a video game. Really weird. It probably looks more like this in the NES version if I'm honest, but you can still see it here. Honestly though, the NES version looks pretty good for the time. It scrolls seamlessly too, at least compared to Super Mario Bros. 2. There isn't a stall when the screen catches up with you even when you are platforming upwards. Nice. All they really did was make the backdrop more dynamic and liven up the colors when transferring it over to the Super Nintendo after all. Not only does the game have all these little details while looking good, but the music is catchy as all well. Even when remixing a previously used track, this game is incredibly charming all around. 
even teaches kids about Japanese folklore. Yeah, what? You think someone from Nintendo looked, took a bunch of mushrooms and thought, man, what if a leaf turned into some type of raccoon? No, come on now. I'm no expert, but I do know some Japanese folklore on the Tanuki using leaves to transform into statues, as well as their ability to fly. I could rant for years on the subject, if I'm honest. I just like how many nods and small things they added to the game. Even the joke about the princess being in another castle is also charming. Honestly, feeling this game, it, it just has slightly more charm and better writing than Super Mario World. One thing it falls short, though, is the gameplay. Now that being said, the gameplay here is no way bad. It just isn't as precise as Super Mario World. It's still great! Basically, Mario runs and jumps better than ever in this game. He builds up speed, and you can even see this in a meter on the screen. This shows you roughly how high and far Mario is going to jump. Build up the meter with speed, and you can even do a high jump. Pretty useful. Also returning from previous games, a mushroom makes you grow bigger. This lets you take an extra hit, but also makes you a bigger target. Fire flowers return too, letting you blast foes with fire powers. Nice. Next is the raccoon suit. Grab a leaf, as previously mentioned, and gain a raccoon tail. You can swat nearby enemies with this, as well as fly if you gain full speed. A more powerful version of this exists as a tanuki suit. This allows you all the powers of the raccoon suit, but you can also turn into a statue. Statue Mario allows you to hide from enemies, as well as smite enemies you normally can't jump on if you transform into the air above the enemy. Nice! The frog suit allows you extra mobility in the water. The suit makes swimming more precise, but it isn't one for one, and your speed will often lose you the power up entirely. Yeah, that's probably not really all that good. On land, the frog suit is even worse. You can hop higher, but you can only hop around. Not my favorite power-up, that's for sure. Then there's the hammer suit. Remember how absurdly annoying the Hammer Brothers was when you first encountered them in Super Mario Brothers? You know, the original game? Well, now you get to be that annoying to your enemies! Yeah! This suit can destroy any enemy, including ghosts. This thing is very strong, making more tragic when you lose it due to a pot shot from an enemy. Outside of that, Invincibility Star can take out everything as well. Nice. This game uses these a lot more, that's for sure. Fun to decimate everything with one touch, you know, using touch damage like these guys do to you. However, some of the levels use these stars as a method to progress, so beware. Yeah, you probably know what that means. That makes some levels needlessly difficult. This is thankfully a rare situation, however, and most of the levels are challenging, but fun. The hardest levels are oftentimes skippable as well. You don't have to hit up every level. You are often given a choice, but sometimes the harder levels hide treasures too. Regardless, other than one or two examples, nothing in this game is super taxing. Overall, the game has more pacing issues than anything. Why the hell is World 3 and World 6 the toughest worlds in the game? Weirdest thing about the game, still the levels are mostly really fun. World 8 with all the tanks is probably my favorite though, along with worlds 4, 3, and 2. Hell, the king in world 3 looks suspiciously like Mario. Huh, weird. More of that charm, some of the islands in that world also look like Japan. Neat. But honestly, I like the challenge of said levels more. Also, finding secrets in World 2 and 3 is super fun, so easily some of my personal faves. The only real issue with the levels are the actual boss fights. First, let me address Boom Boom, the mid-boss fight you find in every castle in the game. He is so easily defeated, it is absurd. He has different abilities, able to run really fast, or fly, or jump around. But if you learn the timing of him, you can easily crush him after the first hit. See, when you hit him, he forms spikes to defend himself. But once those are gone, he is immediately vulnerable to be hit again. The timing isn't too picky either. You have a decent amount of time before he becomes a problem again. I learned this as a kid too, so it shouldn't be too hard. Boom Boom is always a joke. Then the Koopalings. Larry is easy, 
Morton is more aggressive, shooting his wand more. Iggy is faster. Roy stuns you. And Ludwig pretty much does all of the above. Still, if I didn't actually look that up, I'd have never been able to tell you the differences other than the stunning that Roy and Ludwig does. They are different, but not different enough. The only real different boss fights are, well, World 3 and 6 again. Shocker. Wendy, the boss of World 3, shoots evil candy rings, making her more challenging than most of her brothers. Lemmy, from World 6, shoot balls out which you can jump on, but he's on one as well, making him kind of unpredictable. These two bosses are probably the fun ones as they aren't very repetitive. You only see them once in the game. Bowser is also pretty good as well. He basically ground pounds at you, will spit fire at you like a rap artist, and, you know, he eventually puts himself through the floor and defeats himself. You just need to dodge. But sometimes when he jumps, he will change the timing of his fire compared to his jumps, so it kind of makes it a slightly trickier situation than I might make it sound, just to let you know. Overall, serviceable, but lacking for sure. Thankfully, the levels more than make up for it. Oh, and remember how I talked about liking finding secrets in my games? Naturally, since I brought it up, you can probably bet there are a ton of secrets in most of these levels. Lives? You can gain a ton of these in this game. Coins? And they only get you more lives, but there are plenty of those around as well. There are places to get tons of coins, and the bonus areas you can find a lot of lives. They actually mostly look pretty different from one another, too. Letter levels even have secret power-ups like the Tanuki suit. This makes levels so fun to explore. Never know what you'll find. All of which are very useful to a point. However, it's pretty easy to drown in lives in this game if you know what you're doing. Worse yet, there are a bunch of places you can literally grind for lives, which I find isn't really needed in this game. There are also places in the overworld to explore. You can find toad houses for free power-up that is stored for later use if you're, you know, having trouble with a level. You can find places to spin roulette minigames for lives, which, you know, if your timing is good, you can actually get a lot of lives. And if you get enough points, you can also get a card matching game to appear for more lives and power-ups. You can beat up Hammer Brother mini-bosses on the world map for more useful items. You can get enough coins in certain levels and get a white toad house. White Toad Houses give you a very unique and powerful item. Princess Peach will also send you some of these at the end of each world, other than World 7 and World 8, obviously. Find a cloud to skip a level, giving you shit, or a P-Wing to give you infinite flight in one level. Even a music box to put Hammer Brothers on the map, you know, put them to sleep so you can pass them without fighting them. Then they're the magic whistles. You can find three of them and skip basically to the end of the game. One is behind one of the first levels in the first world, one is in a secret area in the first castle, and one is hidden in the overworld map to world 2. Um, basically, you have to defeat a fire brother to get it, and it's probably the only place that you're actually going to find a fire bro, so there you go. Nice. There's also a secret coin ship, but I didn't manage to spot it on this run. Pity. Last but not least, the Game Boy Advance port. I haven't talked about this much, because there aren't many differences to talk about, sadly. It was the last port, and they didn't really add too much to it other than a few quality of life additions to, you know, helping you find secrets. However, the footage you are currently seeing isn't the regular game. That's right, new Mario levels. However, good luck getting any of these. Back in the days of the Game Boy Advance, there was there's advanced machine, I guess, called the e-reader, an interactive trading card add-on for the Game Boy Advance. The thing was a total piece of crap, if I'm going to be honest. A good idea, but not utilized well enough. They tried connecting the advanced port of Super Mario Bros. 3 to the thing. It was a pain in the ass because you needed basically the e-reader, two Game Boy Advance setups, so two Game Boy Advance consoles, um, Super Mario Bros. 3, obviously, and cards. You could find some power-ups to help your adventure out, but the real joy was new unlockable levels. However, we didn't get all the level cards here in the States! Oh, joy! However, 
there is a way to officially access the e-reader levels, which is more or less brand new content. I said officially, so put your damn Dolly Roger down. You actually gain access to all the new levels immediately without any e-reader cards on the Wii U Virtual Console port of said game. Yep, that makes the Wii U port a bit valuable, and since I have the port, I can play said levels. They are challenging, sometimes lost levels like, but they're fun and add new Mario content, so I'd say it's worth the effort if you have a Wii U. Look, no game is without its flaws. But when the only thing that comes to mind is the boss fights are slightly repetitive with five of the eight main boss fights, yeah, that's an issue for sure, but it's not a big enough one to hurt my enjoyment of said game. They do get progressively more difficult, technically. Outside of that, you have a game with fantastic charm, decent story, especially for a Mario game, fun gameplay, great levels, although the pacing is slightly weird, and secrets and fun discoveries around every corner. After all these years, this game is still a masterpiece. Yep, this game gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Remember, 10 out of 10 doesn't mean perfect or flawless. To me, it simply means the issues of the game weren't big enough to dampen your overall enjoyment of said game. And that's about where this game is for me. What about you, Mario? This game is uh, pretty good. Next game is even better though. Let's -a go! Well, damn. Even Mario likes Super Mario World over Super Mario Bros. 3. Guess I'm sitting in a minority on that opinion. Oh well. If everything goes right, you will have your final Mario video of March next week. Been fun? But let's end this. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this fun review. If you liked it, leave me a like, check out my channel. I've reviewed a lot of Mario, both 2D and 3D, as well as many other games. I'm also doing a lot of Zelda lately, too. But that's all the time I have for this round. Thank you guys so much for watching, and take care. Bye bye <laughs>